This is video 12 in our series, Topics in Tensor Analysis. Um, a reminder that the playlist for all the videos is at the uh, website, digital-university.org. Okay, um, in this video, we want to give a very basic definition and uh, demonstration of the metric tensor. And here we have two sets of coordinate systems. This is just flat plane ones. It can be just plain old Cartesian coordinates, x1, x2, x3, x4, and likewise for these set of coordinates, the x5, x6, x7, and so forth. And here we have a set of curvilinear coordinates, y1, y2, y3, y4, y5, y6, and so forth. And here we have a displacement vector dx. Now, if we have um, just a two-dimensional system with axis x1 and x2, and then we have a displacement vector dx, the magnitude of that, of course, is ds. That, in general, is the magnitude of arc length. Here, just by using the Pythagorean theorem, we note that this is dx1, and this component is dx2. So, just by using the Pythagorean theorem, we would say that ds squared is dx1 squared plus dx2 squared. Then if we had more coordinates in our system, we could just keep writing then dx3 squared and so forth. Well, there's a very succinct way that we can write all of this. So that this is equal to Kronecker delta m n d x m d x n. Now, what kind of expression does this give us? Well, we see that m and n appear upper and lower, so we know we're going to sum over them. With the Kronecker delta, this equals 1 when m and n have the same value. If they don't have the same value, it's 0. So let's start summing. We have m equals 1, and then all the other terms are going to be 0 except when n equals 1. So we would have dx1, dx1, or that's dx1 squared, which is what we have here then we would have m equals 2. The next non-zero contribution is then when n equals 2. So we have dx2 squared, and that's from here. Then the next zero contribution will be when m equals 3 and n equals 3. So we have dx3 squared which is what we have here. So here is just a real handy way to use the properties of the Kronecker delta function. When these are not equal, it's 0. When they are equal, it's 1. And again, we know that with these repeated indexes, upper or lower, that we're going to be summing over them. So here then we can just write that ds squared equals the Kronecker delta mn dxm dxn. Now, for our vector, 
our vector dx, and here's the vector dy, it's the same physical quantity in each case. So the length of it here has to equal the length of it in this coordinate system. But here we have our expression for ds squared. How can we write it? How can we write an expression for it in our curved linear y coordinate system? Well, in the first video, we demonstrated that this, dxm, we can write like this. The partial of xm with respect to y dy. And here we're going to have another repeated index, say we can call it r. This is dxm. And again, we're assuming that we know the transformation equations to go from this coordinate system to this coordinate system and go from here to here as well. So that means that from those equations we can certainly take these partial derivatives. And then dxn, that's going to be a similar expression. I'm going to take the dy, take this out and put it back in in just a second. But this would be the partial of xn with respect to y. Now here we had a dy r, then from here we'll have another dy and another repeated index like this. So here then is a longer way that we can write ds squared. And it turns out this expression right here is what are called the metric tensor. And notice that with the metric tensor, we're taking partial derivatives with respect to y, and we have these labels, r and s. So it's written g, y, r, s. I'm writing them downstairs because they appear in the denominator of this expression. So we're not going to try to give any deep meaning to this um, expression now, but just to point out that this is what is called the metric tensor. So we have ds squared equals And that would be the general formula for writing this in the y coordinate system. Now, what we can show without too much trouble is that this entity, which is really this, transforms like a covariant tensor. And let's just do that. That doesn't take too much time. Now here, remember when we started out, we were in a Cartesian system. And here we could say, oh, ds squared, that's just the Kronecker delta, mn, dxm, dxn. And here it's a much simpler expression because we're dealing just with the um, plain old Cartesian coordinates. Well, let's say that then that here we had a curvilinear system. Like this. So here would be dx1, dx2, dx3, dx4, and this would be dx5, dx6, dx7, dx8, and so forth. Well now, here then, 
we have to write the more general expression for ds squared. Here it would be ds squared, and again we're having a small displacement vector like this. And we say, okay, now, here ds squared will be equal to, now we have to write a more general expression. Now we just don't have the friendly um, Cartesian coordinates anymore. So we would say it is g x m n d x m d x n. This now is the more general way of writing the arc length using the um, the metric tensor, as we just demonstrated a few moments ago, only it was for this coordinate frame. In this coordinate frame, we would have this type of expression. Well, now as we noted that here, the length of this vector and the length of this vector is the same in either system. So this would equal, putting ds squared now for the y frame, that is g of y, then we had r s dy r dy s. This is supposed to be an r. Okay, but now let's do what we did before. dx m Remember, that's equal to the partial of x m with respect to y r, dy r, we'll write that in just a moment, then this is the partial of x n with respect to y s, and we have dy r Y S, and this is equal to this G Y R S D Y R D Y S. So that clearly implies then that this and this are the same quantity. So let's write it out. We have G Y R S equals this. The partial of X M with respect to y r, the partial of x n, with respect to y s, times this, g of x m n. And indeed, if you go back in the earlier videos, I think particularly in video number five, we discussed the transformation patterns of contravariant and covariant vectors and tensors. This is the general pattern for covariant transformation. And in fact, the uh, sort of mnemic device for remembering covariant transformation is, well, here, we're going to be taking partial derivatives with respect to y, and these, and they're going to carry, one partial will have the r label, and one partial will have the s label. If this is going to transform um, like a covariant tensor, then the partial of y r and the partial of y s has to appear in a denominator, because there are subscripts over on this side, and indeed they do. Now over here, on this side of the equation, we have 
GXMN. So we're taking the partials of X. One will carry the M label. One will carry the N label. And if this is a covariant transformation, then these had to be the repeated indexes. And if they're downstairs here, then they have to appear up in the numerator over here, which is exactly where they appear. So this, in fact, is the general pattern for um, covariant transformation. So what we've shown is that the uh, metric tensor that we've defined right now we had this expression that indeed this does transform like a covariant tensor. And that's all I want to say on this video. We just want to try to give a very simple uh, derivation of the metric tensor and a very basic demonstration that, in fact, for the metric tensor that we defined here, and indeed it does transform like a um, covariant tensor. Okay, um, that's it for this video. In the next video, we're going to give a more general um, definition of the metric tensor, and then we'll talk more specifically about covariant metric tensors and contravariant uh, metric tensors. So come back and join us for that video, and then we'll continue along here with our discussion.